The Australian government is worried because, of course, it has a subservient and sycophantic relationship to the US. Um, there's been political commentary about that in the past, where the, where the lapdogs of the US, where the junior Texas Cowboys, I think John Howard, um, all sorts of um, disparaging comments were made about he and his relationship. Um, the, and these things are invariably driven by, um, firstly, economic considerations. Uh, they're driven, um, secondly, by um, geopolitical strategic decisions. Um, and thirdly, and a distant third, is the individual rights of, of the citizen. Um, and so the Australian government's embarrassed. They knew that there's been revelations. They know there's going to be more revelations. Uh, and um, they're embarrassed about, I would expect that they should be embarrassed about the unlawful pretext for the war in Iraq. Um, we know that there's been a terrible loss of Australian life in, in, um, from the armed services, but that's incomparable to the tens of thousands of innocent civilians in Iraq itself that have been killed um, for a war that was initiated on a false pretext. And we're a party to that. Um, and you'll remember recently that Tony Blair, I think he encapsulated the, the, the attitude of the West when he said, you know what, um, even if this is in the Chilcot, Chilcot inquiry, even if the um, war itself was unlawful, um, I don't care, I would have still gone ahead and invaded the country um, using then the pretext of regime change as the, the basis for the invasion and the occupation. We, um, that's unlawful, he should be prosecuted as a war criminal. John Howard, Alexander Downer and Philip Ruddock should be prosecuted as war criminals because that's what they are. It's amazing, isn't it? There's, there's, there's an investigation in the UK, um, but in Australia, there's such a marginal difference in the political spectrum now between the two mainstream political parties um, that they, um, they're trying to outbid each other for the, the centre. And so um, they're both um, hand in glove in the war in Iraq and they don't want to be criticised. The extradition process will take about three days. The judge will make, we expect, a quick decision because of the controversy and the public interest in the case. But then inevitably there will be an appeal process. The Swedish and the UK governments will appeal an adverse finding and conversely will appeal if he's extradited. Um, because we all know the main game in, in, in this extradition proceeding. It's not what's going to happen in Sweden. Whether the case against him is meritorious or not, that's not the main game. The main game is the US. And where we have senior Republican politicians calling for his assassination, execution, detention in Guantanamo Bay, how can he get a fair trial process in, in the US? Um, we know that um, many um, academics and other um, people who have studied the, the um, Assange case and the Daniel Ellsberg case, the Pentagon case, case depending on papers goes, see it on all fours with each other. And they know that it's a First Amendment freedom of speech type case. And they know, I think the, um, the um, Congress um, um, uh, Research Service has uh, been asked to investigate whether Assange has been involved in any criminal activity and they can't identify anything. So the only way that they can link him with a, a offending is through Bradley Manning, the person who originally um, obtained the material and then distributed it. Um, so if they can establish a conspiracy between Manning and Assange, then they can charge him. But there's simply no evidence of a conspiracy. Um, and uh, so we say that there's no basis for him to be extradited to the US. But it's not a simple question of an analysis of the law. It's all those other factors that come into play, uh, the politics, um, the economics, and other factors that will seem to take a primary um, position over the rule of law. What would happen, even if the extradition process runs its full course, and even if there's an adverse finding, there's potentially an appeal to the European um, Human Rights um, Commission or courts. Um, and it may be, 
um, hopefully, that um, even if ultimately in the UK they, there's a decision to extradite him, that the European Union won't permit it. Um, because um, where the proceedings can be argued um, um, that they're a sham because there's some ulterior motive um, that's not really um, genuinely uh, connected to the allegations, then uh, we would hope that there would be intervention. The Australian public has a, a critically important role. It's, it's a, we're in interesting times to see the, um, the, the uh, development of mass movements throughout the world, everywhere, not, not, not just controversially in Tunisia or Egypt or Jordan, everywhere. Because now people are saying, we don't want our governments to mislead us, we don't want our governments to be dishonest, we don't want our governments to treat us like, um, uh, like we're um, uh, not worthy of an intellectual understanding of the processes. We, we want to be treated respectfully and, and um, on an intellectual basis. And so the public should be saying to their politicians, you should insist that he be brought home. He's an Australian citizen. You can't abrogate your responsibilities to him. You need to protect him. Um, you need to stand up um, and show some, um, some fortitude um, and stop being so spineless in your attitude. Now, um, politicians being, generally speaking, as fickle as they are, um, they'll be worried about repercussions electorally. And uh, we saw it in the David Hicks case critically, where David Hicks was portrayed as someone that he wasn't. Um, the worst of the worst in Guantanamo Bay that had to be prosecuted first, well, we knew that that was just a nonsense and a sham. They did the same in the Jack Thomas case where they portrayed him as Osama Bin Laden's white boy in Australia. That was a nonsense, never capable of any, any, um, any vindication. And Jack Thomas was exonerated completely. David Hicks, it was now seen to be the inconsequential figure that he truly is. Um, and so um, there was a groundswell of support in both of those cases. It took a long time, but I think these things build on, on each other and I think um, you can see by the people, number of people here tonight, this has really resonated within the Australian community. Julia Gillard, who we've all tried to like and support, I think, um, has misread the, public, the public's view on this. She seriously misread it. Australian community, I think, want people to stand up for um, their fellow citizens, particularly where there, there is no wrongdoing capable of being substantiated. Yes, that's an interesting question. Um, politically, um, you wouldn't have much confidence in the government. You wouldn't want them to simply capitulate um, in the way that they have previously. Um, but uh, we've got a protocol in place that says we will not extradite to a country where there's a risk of, of um, capital punishment or execution. Um, if they say that Assange has been involved in an act of espionage or that he's um, infringed US security, national security interest, and he's at risk of execution, then the Australian government could not extradite him. Um, and they, I think they would be acting unlawfully if they allowed that to occur. So we want him brought home and we want him protected. It's critically important that you agitate with your local member of parliament. They're your representative. If you think what's happened to Julian Assange is unfair, let alone unlawful, then speak to your local politician and demand and insist that he be returned safely home to Australia. Thank you.